This is the Power to Podcast, show 157. One of the things that a, st a study shows, too, is that the teachers who can uh, do these social-emotional learning skills for their own well-being, that their well-being increases. So, you know, when they're doing social emotional learning, when they're doing the skill, you know, when they're uh, practicing self-regulation, when they're practicing these things that their skills do also increase and then their well-being increases. Welcome to a real world education with insight and advice from teachers in the game, where current and former educators reveal what truly sets apart the great teachers and what it takes to make a positive impact on students. Whether you're in pre-service learning, new to the game, or a seasoned veteran, this is the show for you. You'll leave feeling inspired to take action because we are powering education by empowering you. Hey, what's going on, everyone? This is Ken Herman, host of the Power to Podcast, and I'm here with my co-host, Mr. Matt, the Matching Man Rogers. Matt, we are wearing very similar styled shirts today, and I think that's the first time in my entire life I could ever say that about you and I. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Hi. How are we doing, man? Hey, I am spectacular. How are you? I'm doing very well. Uh, we are recording this at the... Uh, day after my winter break ending and the and the very 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 tail end of of your winter break ending and and I feel like tonight's conversation kind of aligns with that a little with it with it being about the social and emotional learning and those those key traits for for students and for for teachers yeah absolutely i yes i i agree i am i am clear uh for the the fact of teaching purposes, I am not clear in terms of life purposes, but that's a okay. <laughs> um, but the the past few days, uh, I, I don't know if you felt this way. As mentioned, holidays, there's a lot going on, but we had a longer holiday break than I expected. We had 12 days off, and Kristen, my wife, and I kind of sat down and were like, Hey, we should travel somewhere. We should like we're gonna be bored at home. We got a baby coming in like three months. Like mm -hmm. we were not bored at home at all. We had so many things going on, but it was great to be able to take that time so that when school starts back up, you know, I can kind of give it my all and not feel like I'm distracted until baby girl Rogers comes. So holiday season this reset this uh, adjustment is everything that i needed to be and came at the perfect time yeah i mean i was it was interestingly having a conversation today with a teacher about breaks and about summer break and how you shouldn't be a teacher to have your summers off but having your summers off is very necessary for for teachers and i think it's really important for you and I, for our listeners to think about how you feel coming out of a, a break, whether it be spring break, winter break, summer break, and how do you find small ways to create those similar feelings for you in the middle of March when it is just an endless pool of five-day weeks with no end in sight and you're you're grinding to state tests and, and different stressful moments of the year and, and finding ways to create that, whether it just be on a weekend or at night, but really finding ways to separate. And uh, I always encourage you and I encourage our audience a lot about set about like putting the devices away. And, and I really did a good job of this, this break to the point of on Wednesday. So the week between Christmas and New Year's, I realized that I didn't have a podcast up and ready to to publish for Thursday. And in that moment, I said, you know what? Nobody needs it. And so I just forgot about it. And we skipped the week. And we've never skipped a week before. I've never missed a week other than purposely skipping Thanksgiving the last two years. And I, I thought to myself, nobody needs a podcast right now. Nobody needs it over break. And I, I don't need to ruin my night 
um, you know, stressing to get it all published and ready and out there. And so now we're skipping two weeks a year, it, it seems like. And so it was just in that moment, that idea of just keeping the device off, keeping it away. And we, we talk about setting boundaries like that tonight. You and I have a little debate on what your philosophy should look like. And, and there is no right philosophy. It's just about teachers separating that, that personal and, and professional life. And we've had a couple of recent guests. Um, I want to pull up those, those show numbers real quick. We've had a couple of recent guests that, that we talk about this. So we had Suzanne Daly on, on show 155, which was just two episodes ago. And a little bit before that on show uh, 149, Grace Stevens, it's all about um, our own emotional intelligence and our own happiness and, and, and just feeling, feeling balance. And, and Kathy Magnuson does a great job tonight of showcasing how you can do that in the classroom to support your students and to teach them but also how to take those same principles and, and apply it to our own life. And so I, I really thought it was, was a valuable conversation for our audience. So if it's okay with you, Matt, I want to. Well, I was going to say, go ahead, please. I have this box and this box is thank you cards. And I listened to your advice so well that I didn't even write thank you cards to my kids for the gifts that I got before the holiday break which I know I was supposed to do as I got them, right? I yep. know I was supposed to, it was mass chaos and I was counting down the moments like they were, but I was so into my break and so off of my device and so not worried about teaching and knowing that they were getting love from other places that didn't need to be me. It is the night before I go back. I legitimately, Hopefully my supervisor not not hearing this have no clue what I'm teaching tomorrow and I'm totally okay with it. So if that's the clearance you need to get, it is what it is. Tomorrow is a, a gather and see where we're at kind of day anyway, and we will, you know, push until the end of the school year and uh, make up that time later. So just saying it's a it's okay. You know, tomorrow will come and go. It'll probably be a rough one, but it doesn't matter how prepared I was gonna be, it was probably gonna be a rough one. So just putting it out there. Well, I'm proud of you. Um, but thank you cards is the only, that's where I draw the oh, line on. Oh, <laughs> I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. So um, no, I, I think that's great. So let's check in with Teach Better and then jump right into our conversation with uh, Kathy Magnuson. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. Hi, Kathy. Welcome to the Powered Up Podcast. How are you doing tonight? Great. Great. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. We're super excited for this conversation. So start things off for us and our, and our audience. Uh, please officially introduce yourself. Let us know where you are coming from and give us a background of your experience in education. Yeah. So I'm Kathy Magnuson. I am coming from Northwestern Minnesota. So I am located right by the Canadian border. And if you are familiar with uh, Polaris snowmobiles, ATVs, we are the home of Polaris in Roseau, Minnesota. So that's where I'm coming from you from uh, this evening. And I have been uh, working in education for over 25 years in a lot of different capacities. I started out in the classroom as a science teacher. So I taught middle school and high school science, life science, earth science, and then uh, had an opportunity after 10 years of being in the classroom, moving into a position in our school that was for social emotional learning. So I've been doing social emotional learning before it was even really called social emotional learning. Uh, I've been doing that with a off and on for about 18 years now. And actually we called it at that time, cooperative life skills, because it was a lot about conflict resolution. But now we're mm. seeing the evidence that uh, social emotional learning is needed in our classrooms and even more so now after coming out of the pandemic. Definitely. So I, I wanna ask more important questions than my first one, but this is just pure curiosity. We're recording this on, January 2nd, 2024, it'll come out probably in about a month or so. 
have you had snow yet and how much snow have you already had? Yeah, great question. Uh, you know, we did have snow, then it went away, then it snowed a little bit. We had a little dusting on Christmas Day. And uh, right now our roads are like sheer ice. And we've had a multitude of people uh, having um, been out on the lake and then having to be rescued from the lake because ice fishing is a big thing up here. And we're about 20 miles Mm -hmm. from Lake of the Woods. And uh, there's yesterday there was a number of people that had to be rescued from the lake because of um, the ice cracking not being able to get over the ice. So yeah, it's been kind of a really unusual winter and uh, people who love outdoor winter sports are not very happy. Yeah, it's, it's, we live in the, in Pennsylvania, so, you know, Northeast and it's been for the most part unseasonably warm. It gets, you know, cold at night, but Anyway, I digress. I was just curious. No, so that's okay. <laughs> you, t- you transitioned you transitioned into a position uh, focused around social emotional learning. You you said it was co- cooperative life skills, which which I like that name. Where did that idea stem from to be so important in your in your district 18 years ago that they created a full-time teaching position for that? So Kind of what was the cause of that and, and where did it initially pick up momentum when you when you made that transition? Yeah, and it wasn't, uh, I will go back to saying that it wasn't full time. It was a part time position. So okay. and it was uh, through a grant that we had received from a foundation. And so that allowed that grant allowed us to um, have people in the classroom. Well, me in the classroom doing lessons. I would go in once a week and in each of the kindergarten through sixth grade classrooms and would be teaching lessons on, oh, you know, feelings and uh, how to uh, do eye messages. And what the thing is, is that I never learned these uh, in growing up myself. I never learned it in uh, teacher prep. Uh, and we never talked about something like that. And growing up on a farm in southern Minnesota that with German heritage, uh, we didn't really talk too much about our feelings. I don't know about what it's like in Pennsylvania, but uh, that was just not the common thing around the dinner table. And so it took a lot of unlearning for myself and relearning as far as um, having to go in and, and then teach these skills to children that were skills that I wasn't uh, really trained in either. So it was a lot of learning on both on both sides. And what really precipitated that was uh, having it in our school was that uh, we had a great social worker and she was really the champion of having social emotional learning in our classrooms. She's the one uh, that the grant was given to and our administration had said, yeah, let's, yeah, let's try it. And so uh, it's been a position. And then when they haven't had grant funding, it's gone away. And, um, but it just puts more stress on our social worker then when that happens, because she did, when I'm in the classrooms, I can be teaching these skills and then she comes in and uh, works with the uh, kids who need extra help, extra skill building. So I got to I, I got to jump in. I was a yeah. little distracted. I Ken will uh, yell at me for this. I was trying to see how close I've been to you, uh, Lake of the Woods County. Uh, I went to uh, Voyagers National Park, so not too far away, but oh, yeah. it is beautiful yeah. up there. And when you were talking about the ice fishing and driving, Ken, if you're not familiar, they... For me, it is just mind blowing that the ice gets so thick that you can just drive on the ice with your vehicles. And uh, then in the summer, once it melts, then there's boat boating and it is fascinating. But I digress. Um, I think one of the things that I find so interesting and you obviously know the idea of importance of social emotional learning by introducing yourself and saying that it was something you guys were prioritizing before it became popular to uh, advocate for it. I guess what I would love to know is 
where are the uh, features that you felt like you had such a jump start on uh, supporting kids that you guys have gotten so strong at that it was interesting to watch other members of the school community or other friends in other school districts have to play catch up on? And maybe what were some areas that you did not have that advantage because, you know, we'll say exterior resources weren't as readily available as they are now to support you to do your job? Yeah. So that's a big question right there. As far as um, support, I would say that, um, you know, since I've been doing this, there's, of course, been staff turnover. So you have new staff coming in. So it's not always um, consistent, but what has been consistent is the social worker that I work with that's been the advocate for it in the school. And I really believe she's been the strong champion of carrying through and working, especially with our elementary students in bringing social emotional learning into those classrooms and then working with the teachers on on doing so. So I would say that um, she sees the benefits and I do too. I'm not there every day. I'm only there one day a week because of funding. I have been cut back or they're cutting cutting back just because the money isn't there. So I uh, hope hope to um, uh, provide some resources then for teachers to help carry on the lessons that I come into the classroom with for the students and, and for them too. In fact, you know, I've had teachers when I was uh, doing a, I'm lessons on uh, iMessage, how to tell other people how you feel. And she said to me, she goes, you know, this, this can work for me too. And I said, oh yeah, I use it on my husband all the time. I said, so, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you you too as adults can pick up on these skills and use them in your in your life and so i think that has been the overall theme of just that uh consistent funding hasn't been there and and it still is now we had money from you know the esser money so they were able to bring me in and i was able to do more classrooms and do some professional development around it now the esser money is gone and um, yeah, my time's being cut back. So it's just a, I'm not a consistent contracted um, on a consistent teacher contract. It's a, it's a program that's strictly grant funded. So if you were to go back to your position, teaching middle school science full time <laughs> over the last 18 years in the position you've been in focusing on this idea of SEL and, and the the cooperative life skills, how would it impact the way you facilitated your science classroom, whether that be through community building activities specifically targeted at these skills? But I'd like to know that. But also, how would you change, you know, the majority of what you do in the classroom, which is providing instructional opportunities for your students to learn? So I'm curious how yeah. it would impact the way your classroom operates. So here's here's kind of an interesting thing about me is that back when um, I was teaching science, I was very hands-on, student-centered. Uh, the book was a guide. It wasn't what we used every day. I had like maybe a classroom set of the books and we did a lot of hands-on activities. We did project-based learning. And so uh, cooperative learning, I had that in my um, toolbox. So I was really very much about being student centered, having students lead things. And I think the biggest change now, if I went back into the classroom would be me. I would be the biggest change because it's not so much how I implement my lessons, but how much I would regulate my nervous system. Because let me tell mm. you, there were times I flew off the handle. And I'm not proud to say that, but, you know, you just have those kids or certain, um, you know, things build up in you and um, all of a sudden it just kind of uh, things fly off the handle, right? You know, we're all human. Mm -hmm. And I think Absolutely. my biggest uh, change would be me because of all the things that I've had to teach 
kids with social emotional learning and my own social emotional learning, my own um, ability to see what are my strengths, what are my values, where, you know, where I have those placed, that would be my biggest change, I would say. I, yeah. Uh, curriculum wise, you know, the curriculum probably has changed quite a bit since I've been in the classroom, but you know, um, yeah, that's what I would say. How would you, how would you encourage us as, as individuals, as, as teachers, as spouses, as, as parents, you, you know, you, you just spoke to reflecting on, on your own actions when you were in your classroom and looking at it now. How would you encourage us to, whether it be daily, weekly, monthly, reflect on our own emotional tel- intelligence and our own interactions with um, not just students, like I said, the other important people in our lives to help us recognize where we can do better or where mm-hmm. we can maybe do different and yeah. kind of evaluate ourselves in, in the way we interact with people to make it more positive experiences. Yeah, and I think the biggest part is um, uh, adding in the time to have that reflection. I think in any in in everybody's life, it's go 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 go. Uh, there's so much going on, and and I think one of the things that I've built into my life is a really consistent morning routine where I add in reflection and some time with my coffee and myself and, you know, and, and not everybody has that advantage. Not everybody is able to do that, but even five minutes of just not being on your phone, sitting there, taking some deep breaths, getting your nervous system so that you're, you're feeling calm as you're walking out the door instead of, um, you know, rattled or or thinking of everything on your to-do list i think if we can take Mm -hmm. some time to just do that you might see some shifting happen i think uh i've been i don't know if i've been targeted by this through social media or not but the the idea of how difficult it is to be a teacher today and are those differences that substantial than previous teachers it is i think it is very clear where there's strong leadership and strong admin teams and strong faculties uh it makes the the daily challenges all the bit easier to handle and I think what you're saying and what you've learned in this experience is is definitely valuable. When considering things like um, personal days or sick days being used for, you know, getting ourselves right, that might not always be an option. Um, and mm-hmm. so whether you want to kind of phrase it from the lens of, um, supporting teachers to get their minds right, but also how to best regulate self or model, hey, right now I'm not okay. That Mm -hmm. transparency to kids, um, I'm not all there. I'm not able to get myself uh, in a place that I can be my very best and model that to kids uh, that it is okay and how to work through that. Do you have any suggestions in those realms? Because a lot of us are feeling uh, the ebbs and flows or the tugs and the pulls. And there is definitely, at least in my classroom, and we've had a lot more opportunities to speak about this, an acceptance of vulnerability from the teacher to say, hey, this is what's going on. And to to also benefit um, having that conversation with in my case, nine, 10, 11 year olds as well. Yeah. And, you know, modeling those things, I would say too, yeah, there's a lot more put on teachers today than when I was back in regular classroom. I just even think about like all the technology that is used today that 
I didn't have to have my grades up to date at the very minute because, you know, we didn't ha we didn't have that technology where parents could go in and see what their grades are or that the student could see their grade, you know, or even access like the lessons and having those all into Google Classroom. I mean, we didn't have those things. And and so I can just see how the number of stressors have been placed onto onto teachers you know, and then being transparent, yeah, with your students. And I would even say with, um, you know, parents who are willing to listen and be part of that. Uh, I, um, I know when I start feeling frustrated, I will talk to the kids about, you know, I'm feeling really frustrated right now. Uh, I've asked, uh, uh, asked you to quiet down and it hasn't been happening. So I'm you know, I'm going to take some deep breaths and let's see if we can quiet down. You know, it works well, too, because I'm modeling what I'm I'm teaching. And the kids have heard these things about how we should use I statements and how we need to talk about our feelings and how we have to um, find ways to calm ourselves down and and to um, uh, calm our brain down and train our brain to do that. So in my mind, I'm just modeling what I'm teaching. And um, I think setting some of those things up in your classroom, especially with elementary kids, uh, doing that in a way that you have a, a sharing circle, uh, that you're connecting with the kids, that you're allowing them to share things too, uh, having mindful moments. So when I come into the classroom, we always build in different kinds of mindful, mindful moments, things that you can use to, to calm yourself down and, and get yourself into a place of focus. We also use, um, other tools like, um, uh, the zones of regulation. So, you know, you have all these tools and then, um, you as an adult modeling those tools, I think, is so important. You know, if you're talking about zones of regulation and if you're familiar with that and talking about, ooh, I feel like I'm in the yellow zone. I think I need to do, um, you know, do something to get myself back down here. I, I think that's just um, that's just great conversation and modeling. It's something that a lot of times can feel like one more thing. It's one more thing I have to teach my students. You know, I, I'm a I'm a middle school science teacher. My job is to teach science, or I'm a right. I'm a family yeah. and consumer science teacher. That's my content. It's one more thing I have to add. I'm an elementary teacher, and I teach everything. But what you just said is how you can so very easily just blend it into the vocabulary you're using throughout the day where right. it's not something that you're dedicating time to. Maybe, yes, you dedicated 15, 20 minutes to teach the zones initially, but then it's just something that you mention throughout conversation and, and, and throughout modeling. And, and I think it's important not only to embed these ideas, and it doesn't have to be zones of regulation. There's no. hundreds of different of types of emotional intelligence that you can include into the classroom, whether it just be uh, character traits that your school, um, you know, really focuses on, or your district focuses on habits of mind or another thing. There's, there's so many different things that are all about looking at yourself as a person, as a learner, as an individual, as a community member that are important to reflect on in the classroom. And it's important for us to model, like you said, and something that you said really triggered with me about knowing our own boundaries. And, and I, I find that teachers, don't do this maybe because they're not encouraged to, maybe mm -hmm. because they don't feel supported by administrators or they haven't taken the time to think it. But I think one of the most important things a, a classroom teacher needs to do, especially with students and even more so with parents, is set very clear boundaries on what grading looks like, what communication looks like, and more importantly, when. So for mm -hmm. me as a classroom teacher, I told my, my homeroom parents that I will communicate an email every Monday-ish, sometimes it went out on Tuesday, of here what's, here's what's important this week. Fun things, pictures, videos, exciting things to share will be on our classroom Facebook page. Homework will not be an every night type of thing. 
And I do not check email when I go home. I mm -hmm. check email before I leave and I check email when I arrive in the morning. If something is going wrong with homework or anything related to school that is causing stress for you, your child, or more importantly, between you and your child, immediately stop, email me and say, we did not do this tonight because it was causing stress. Mm -hmm. And there will never be a question about why that happened. And don't email me hoping that I'm going to respond at 730 with a solution. Like, and, and I, I never had a parent question me or, you know, ask why is that that way or be upset with me that I wasn't responding to emails at night, but I was very clear with those boundaries. And now we have, like you said, we have LMSs, we have communication apps. There's so many more things that you can have. They're all, all of them go on your phone. Just because they go on your phone doesn't mean they need to be on your phone. And if it being on your phone makes it easier, fine, but lock it. You can, you can turn off apps at a certain time of day. Turn it off. It doesn't need to be there. Same thing with grading. Like you said, you know, it's, it can be in the grade book immediately, but just be clear on things will hit the grade book, you know, two to three days afterwards or whatever that is. Like it's about establishing those boundaries. And I think if there are administrators listening, you need to encourage mm -hmm. your teachers to set those boundaries. You yeah. need to put that idea out there so they feel like it's okay. Mm -hmm. And they even think to do that. I, I just like, think it's so important for teachers to be able to feel that way. Can I, I, totally I just want agree. to counter this and, and I hope that that's not wrong to do so. I've heard you, uh, we've done many episodes together, but it just, it's one of those things that I, I recently shifted from fourth to fifth grade and the independence expected of kids, mm -hmm. not from all parents, but of a fifth grader is even different than a fourth grader that I have a lot of experience with. <clears throat> and the stress being able to say, hey, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. and it's no big deal. We'll handle it together. Doesn't always jive. And I know we have the classic, the night before the science fair and the parent learns for the first moment that yeah. this is happening. But there is definitely some level of communication. And it's really hard to sit here and have my phone. And on my phone, I have a message from a stakeholder in the success of my classroom mm -hmm. to say, here's my boundary being set. Now I say this as a married without children, you know, teacher with very little limitations of why I couldn't step away and send a message. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, we have, you know, you with a gazillion kids at home and obvious <laughs> reasons why you, Ken has three, four on his way. But um, that being said, there are reasons why you may not be able to, you have to draw that line in the sand. It's the same thing from the, the health of knowing that substitutes are not a premium for any of us right now. And you choosing to take a day off for your wealth and health, like wealth and well-being, but also, sorry. Health, health and well-being definitely not well um <laughs> but but on that flip side of things you need to do that yet you know that that might require your grade level teammates or your admin or mm -hmm. your you know your friends your colleagues to be stretched so much thinner for what feels like a, a day that you're allowed to take but a luxury or not the complete intended purpose. And I know that's not our problem, right? That's not why we take these days maliciously by any means, but that is something that is hard to grapple with both like from that external pressure. Like that is a real mm -hmm. thing right now that I, I know that I'm struggling with. And um, just because you know, even on my sickest days, if I can get vertical, I almost feel like I should go into my classroom. Yeah, I used so to. So I have a response to that, but I would love to hear from you first, Kathy. Yeah, you know, and I always thought, you know, teaching is like one of the only jobs that you have to plan to be sick, right? And it mm. almost is like more work to worse. get ready for a substitute than it is to actually just 
drag yourself in there. However, uh, on the flip side, over many years of uh, dragging myself into the classroom and not feeling better, <laughs> I recognized too yeah. that if I just stayed home for a day, um, I could, I pretty much could come back the next day feeling a whole, whole lot better. So I think, you know, there's, there's a lot there to be said too. Yeah. That there isn't, it, it, yeah, it's, it's a hard decision and hard to draw those boundaries and, and you as a individual has to have to be the one that sets your own boundaries. So, you know, like you were saying, Matt, your boundary might be different than Ken's and, and that's fine, but you, you have to draw the boundary and then you have to communicate the boundary. That's, that's the biggie. Yeah. And I, I would say that one, I don't think my boundaries are the right boundaries. They were my boundaries. And, mm -hmm. and like you said, Matt, your family dynamic, your, your stage of life personally, whether that be because of kids, because of taking care of family members, because of, you know, one stressful year versus a different stressful year. There's hundreds of different things, but I had those expectations before I had kids. And, and what I think is important is that boundaries are set so that expectations are clear. Your boundaries can be, I check my email at around 6.30 to 7 o'clock. So if there are concerns when your child first gets home, I'll be able to address them at a reasonable time that evening. So then, then again, parents and, and students, you know, especially if you have high school kids know that that communication can come in that, in that time window so that they, parents know, okay, part of our routine is we have to look at everything before five o'clock so that I can email your teacher if we have questions and we'll get an answer between five thirty and six, right? So that again, that there's clear expectations so that everybody's on the same page. When you sometimes check email at night or your LMS or whatever it is, and then sometimes you don't, then that honestly can make things more difficult for everyone involved because they are expecting you to respond, but then you don't respond and then they might get frustrated. And so I, I don't think there's any right way to do it. I think what's right is being clear of how it will typically be on a daily, weekly basis. and. It doesn't, and, and Matt, and I know you were answering just, or asking that one, because that's your opinion, but also you like to play devil's advocate. I mean, you know, I was a very dedicated teacher mm -hmm. and the parents knew that as well. It was just, this is how it was. And, and part of it was for myself, but part of it was for them too. I wanted them to, I wanted my students and my parents to realize that what we do in class is important. We are learning things that are meaningful, but it's just homework. It's just a project. If something goes wrong, it's okay. Like there are way more important things in life than what you're getting stressed about school. But if a, if a parent emailed me of, you know, this was a, let's go with the science fair example, because that is a classic. If I get that email on Thursday morning when kids are supposed to come in, I'm going to talk to the students and say, you had three weeks to do this and you waited until the night before. I'm glad you stopped because I didn't want you to fight with your, your parents that night, but I want you to understand, I, let's have a conversation about how we got to that moment. And then I'm going to communicate with the parents too of, and not in a way where it was like, you should have fought all night and figured out how to finish this, but like, here's what happened and here's how we got to this. Let's learn from this moment. But again, it, it dissipated the stressful night for the parents and, and the students involved and, and I think just having those conversations and those ideas in mind of modeling with our with our students is is really important. So, so Kathy, how would you encourage teachers that you work with now, or just teachers listening, to start to incorporate these ideas into the classroom? Uh, is it important to pick some type of social emotional learning category like? zones of regulation or habits of mind? Like, is that a starting point to then embed that into your conversations and in your classroom? Where, where can teachers start with something like that? Yeah. And I think a lot of schools are adapt or, you know, adopting some sort of social emotional learning curriculum, probably not all schools, but, you know, I would encourage administrators to look at 
you know, different curriculum so that you have a common language. So everyone in your school is kind of using that common or grade level, even having that common language among them. And then from there, um, you know, picking out those key points of whatever curriculum you're using. I personally have um, kind of combined a number of different uh, things. And some of the things that we, you know, use are just kind of basic uh, social emotional learning, emotional intelligence skills. And the very first one that we work on is regulation. We work on, you know, um, being able to transition from one thing to another because kids have a hard time with that. And uh, using some different tools and not just using those tools when they need to use them, but integrating them throughout the, uh, the day. So I have a chime that we use and I ring the chime and we take three deep breaths together as a class. And then the teacher can, can use their chime when the kids come in from uh, the playground and they say, hey, choom, they ring the chime and, you know, let's all three, all take deep breaths together. And our sixth graders this year, they moved up into the middle school, high school, we're a really small school. And it was just um, the high school teachers hadn't seen the chime. They hadn't done that. I was in teaching a lesson with the sixth graders and I rang the chime. The kids all stopped. We all took deep breaths together and uh, they looked at me and I could just see those uh, classroom teachers that were in there with me were like amazed that the kids stopped. But the thing is, is that those kids have um, had SEL ever since they were in first grade. And, and so, you know, <laughs> it, it was just, it's a consistent thing that they had been doing throughout um, their elementary classroom years. So when they heard the chime, they knew exactly what, what they want, you know, what was the, what was the expectation, as you would say, right? So setting those things into a regular classroom routine is one of the things that I would um, say, and just building in those tools that help to regulate your nervous system. I think that is the biggest thing is training your brain so that you're moving out of the fight, flight, and freeze and being able to move into your your prefrontal cortex where all your learning and focusing happens and then teaching kids that. We do lessons on the brain. We talk about the amygdala. We talk about the prefrontal cortex. So those things are, um, and I know you, as you said, it seems sometimes like it's just one more thing to do, but in the long run, it pays off when you can start implementing these things. You know, the kids catch on. And then before you know it, they're, they're the ones that are sometimes mentioning, um, you know, maybe, maybe you're flipping your lid, Mrs. Magnuson, and you need to you know, take a deep breath, you know, um, they'll, they'll point those things out to you too. Definitely. I remember I was working with a middle school special ed teacher and I was in her class at when, when students were coming in. And they started off with a small regulating activity and then transitioned right into the lesson. And I asked her, is that something that you do every class? And she said, no. She said, but I could tell that they needed it. And if I didn't spend three minutes doing that in the beginning of class, I would have spent 42 minutes yelling mm -hmm. at them the whole time to listen up, sit down, you know, sit up straight, pay attention. She said, I would have lost 20 minutes of instruction trying to trying to get them regulated instead of just regulating everyone in the right. beginning of class. So I want to hit our lesson lens, which is a segment of the show that we actually have not done in a while, Kathy. So I'm really <laughs> excited. We talked about this right before we recorded, whether or not we hit it. So uh, we're going to jump into this and then we'll, we'll move into our exit ticket after that. So the lesson lens, the idea here is that we are going to uh, navigate through a specific unit project or a single lesson that you've done in the past. Matt and I have some prepared questions. Uh, so we will use those questions to kind of go through the, the story of, of the activity with students. So the first question, are you going to talk to us about a unit, a project, or a single lesson? 
uh, probably a single lesson would be a great place to start. Perfect. All right. And to clarify, uh, could you specify the grade level, subject area, and or time of year you would expect this lesson to be? Uh, this is probably a lesson you, you use towards the beginning of the year. And also, it's one that uh, you can do all the way from kindergarten up to, you know, uh, fifth, sixth grade, even, even adults um, talking about the the brain because as you just said can you know uh one of the things is that if you don't do some small regulating activities maybe when kids need them that you're just wasting your classroom time because that survival brain is always going to trump the learning brain so uh i think it's really this lesson is really important to talk about because it's one that helps kids learn about some of the different parts of your brain Perfect. So you kind of hit on the object objectives there, but I'll, I'll ask it if you want to add anything specific. What are the objectives for the lesson? Yeah, so it would be learning about your, your brain and uh, specifically two different parts of your brain that helps you to regulate your uh, emotions. Fantastic. So um... If you were to summarize specifically from the student's point of view, what are they actively doing during this lesson? Well, in, uh, as we talk about the brain, we have like a little model and we use our hand. And I know on a podcast, that's hard to show, um, but I can kind of describe how well, we use our yeah, hand. Yeah, go for it. Because if, yeah, if you're help. listening on Spotify, you can watch us or you can jump over to YouTube and watch as well. Yeah. And this is by uh, Dr. Dan Spiegel. Uh, Spiegel. He talks about the hand model of the brain and, you know, that you have, you know, we're going to raise our hand. This is really a hand, your handy model of your brain. And inside our brain tucked in the middle is our uh, amygdala and that's our thumb. So we just kind of tuck that into our palm and that's like the guard dog. That's a uh, place in our brain that keeps us safe. So when we have something that is really going to, that scares us, or maybe that we feel angry, our brain goes right into that amygdala because it's teaching us to be safe. And then that amygdala is covered. So then we fold our hand down so it covers over our thumb. Uh, by our prefrontal cortex. And that's right up here. That's that thinking part of our brain. So that's like our, our knuckles here. And that prefrontal cortex is the place that we do our learning and that we do our thinking. It um, really helps us to make great decisions. However, when we're into our fight, flight, or free mode, freeze mode, when we're into um, that we have things that we're angry about or that we're scared about, we then flip our lid. And when we flip our lid, we can't get to that thinking part of our brain until we start calming ourselves down so that we can access then that thinking part of our brain to help us to make those good decisions. So with, alum, with uh, kindergarten, first and second graders, we do the hand motions together. And then with uh, third through sixth graders, we talk maybe a little bit more about another part of our brain, which is called the hippocampus. That's the kind of the memory part of our brain. So that helps us to kind of remember when what things might uh, scare us, what might, you know, we have to... Um, have that fight, flight, and freeze reaction about. And so we build, uh, build that into that lesson about how important it is to then stop and think and decide, you know, and, and calm ourselves down so that we can get to that thinking part of our brain. During that lesson, is there anything specific that you're doing to ensure the success of the students? Um, you know, 
and as as we go through it, since I'm kind of one of the uh, people that come into the classroom and then I'm not there every day, so uh, the kids get kind of excited about me coming in. Plus, we also have our routine at the very beginning. I bring in uh, Peaceful Panda. Peaceful Panda always has a classroom question, you know, so they have a sharing question. So we have this whole routine built up when we have to do a, a mindful moment so we can calm ourselves down and, you know, Peaceful Panda doesn't come out until we're all quiet and calmed down because he'll get scared, you know. So we have this whole routine that the kids know. And um, by the time we get through that, they're pretty much, you know, kind of just sitting there for waiting, not sitting there, but they're waiting for the next thing to come. And with the kindergarten, first, second graders, I bring out puppets, which are always a huge hit. And even third graders love the puppets. So it's kind of, and the puppets usually come out with, you know, having some sort of problem that the kids have to help them to solve. So I keep the lesson kind of moving along in a way that uh, keeps their interests going. And there's a lot of uh, interaction with the kids then, you know, helping the puppets to solve their problems and, yeah. And use the skills that we're learning in the classroom at the same time. That is awesome. Um talking about those features and i'm thinking about actually our guidance counselor that uses um friends and my last name is rogers so you know using friends that uh may have you know giving them human characteristics allows them to uh, a lot of times the kids to see the general message without uh the we'll say the the realities of uh, it being a human feature or using some student's situation to make them uncomfortable. Right. All yep. that to say, um, if you were to kind of look back on these style lessons, where are ways that you would enhance or, you know, uh, change to make it even deeper of a connection um, as you continue to offer the style lesson to students? Yeah. And as I, um, as I look back on the lessons in most of the classrooms, I'm only there for 30 minutes and I come in every other, uh, week. So, you know, I don't have a lot of the day to day interaction. And so I do provide some resources for the teachers to go deeper. Uh, I have, uh, I look up like read alouds that go along with it books are great for those deepening interactions because they're again like you said matt you know using the puppet kind of gives them a distance to solve that problem books are kind of the same way right the character can have the problem you can talk about the problem and uh, they can use then whatever skills are being taught to help that character solve the problem so those lit plus it's literature connections that you can have in there um, and so those are some of the things that if I had more time, I love to to do. And then also a, a big thing that I like to bring into our uh, classes is cooperative games. I just love to uh, have cooperative games. So I have certain games that, especially with the older kids that we will play, that will also help where we can in use our communication skills plus it's fun and they're engaged and they're doing things and we uh, debrief it and uh, if i had a little more time i would be doing a lot more of those sort of things too to help deepen those skills Excellent. Thank you for thank you for sharing that. So we're going to jump into our exit ticket, which is the same four questions we ask every guest every week. Question number one, what is the best thing a teacher can do to make a student's school experience better? I think uh, connection, right? We all remember those teachers that we connected <clears throat> with that uh, took the time out of their day to really ask us some questions or recognize if something wasn't going quite right and took the time to just, you know, have that little conversation with us. So I, I really think connection is the, 
the total key. What is the best piece of advice that you've received? And it may have come from a colleague, a supervisor, or even a student. Oh, best piece of advice that I've, I've received. Um, always have that kind of trusted uh, colleague that you can go to when you're having a really bad day and vent and that they'll just listen. I had a teacher when I was first teaching that uh, I could go across the hall after a really bad day and just vent and she would listen and that's all I needed <laughs> and I felt better. So finding, finding that person that you can do that with within your school, I think is so important. Um, kind of adding on to that, we recognize that the school year goes in waves. There are times that are a little bit lighter, and then there are times that it's it almost feels like it's hard to survive. Mm -hmm. What is something you could share with uh, educators to hear that helps them power up through those moments of struggle? Oof. So kind of say the last part a little bit again, Matt. It was a little bit, I don't know, fuzzy. Yeah. Uh, so just that idea of recognizing that we have these tough times, what is a message you think uh, educators should hear to help them get over those uh, challenging opportunities? Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that you can uh, carry along with you is to know that this too shall pass. It's something that I've used uh, for my own mental health to recognize that this is a moment that this too shall pass and that um you know moving through it is hard and difficult and uh coming through can be it can be better on the on the other side and i know there's times throughout the year that it's really hard and difficult and then it will pass and uh, lighten up. <clears throat> it's easy to fall into facilitating a repetitive classroom. What do you think separates the teachers who are the ones constantly seeking to change, innovate, and adopt new teaching strategies? Yeah. Um, one of the things that a, st a study shows too is that the teachers who can uh, do these social emotional learning skills for their own well-being that their well-being increases so you know when they're doing social emotional learning when they're doing the skill you know when they're uh, practicing <clears throat> self-regulation when they're practicing these things that their skills do also increase and then their well-being increases so you know in in some regards having somewhat of a uh, a routine is the thing that a lot of kids do need and that if we can build that in to our classroom but then also continuously learning about yourself i think um you know knowing who you are and who you want to be and how you want to show up because uh you know as the teacher in the classroom you're the one who who brings the weather. You're the one who can bring in uh, the sunshine or you can bring in the rain clouds and set that tone for that classroom. So I think keeping that, that in mind is, is really important. Uh, the last one uh, <laughs> that we have for you is just how do we continue this conversation? How do we stay connected with you and continue to learn with you and from you? Um, whether that's a website uh, or other media source. Yeah, so I have my own business called Wildwood Learning. So if you go to www.wildwood, W-I-L-D-E, W-O-O-D, learning.com, and there you can uh, connect with me. If you go to the bottom of my website, there's a place you can fill in. And I have a, a free download. It's just a simple couple page download and has um, a video that goes along with it about five ways to access the learning brain. So it's like five regulating tools that you can use within your classroom. And that will also put you on my email list and uh, 
uh, keep in touch that way. You can also find me on LinkedIn at Catherine Magnuson. And um, I'm on Facebook at Wildwood Learning. I don't do much on Instagram or Twitter <laughs> or X, whatever it's called now. All good. Well, well, we will link up to all of that on our show notes, which you can find wherever you're watching or listening uh, to, this, to this show. So, Kathy, I really appreciate your conversation and your time tonight. I think that uh, probably 18, maybe 18 years ago, you didn't expect SEL to be as apparent as it is today, but I think that it's super important. And I think what you're doing for your district and everyone that you're working with is important for teachers to continue to feel empowered to find ways to include that into their classroom. So thank you for everything that you do to benefit education, our teachers, and most importantly, our students. So thank you again for your time. For our listeners, thank you for your time for listening. Please share this out. Find a colleague that you think can benefit from this. Uh, follow us wherever you are listening. Subscribe and leave us a rating or reply so we can continue to grow and reach new teachers. And Mr. Rogers, why don't you take us on out of here? All right. As we power down this episode, Kathy, you have absolutely left us powered up. Uh, thank you for the time. And everyone, we'll talk to you next week. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe on whichever platform you're listening to or watching us on YouTube. Each week we get to talk to amazing educators. We're making a positive impact on the lives of students, their colleagues, administrators, and education as a whole. It's been such a privilege every week to be able to talk to these incredible individuals, learn from them, grow with them, and better myself and all of education through these conversations. If you haven't already, please consider sharing this with a colleague, someone who can benefit and be powered up from the experience of listening to these incredible conversations. Because of Powered Up, we are powering education by empowering you.